Hello and welcome to the channel. I wanted to try something a bit different to my usual cinematic videos in order to address a specific comment made by a viewer of my ME410 vs B26 Marauder and P47 Escorts video, in which it was claimed that the only way a 410 could take down a P47 was if the pilot had flown it like a Piper Cub. These kinds of comments are frequent no matter what kind of aircraft is being compared at the time, and this is to be expected, as we all have our favourite aircraft and pilots who flew them, and oftentimes what plays out in the video contradicts what we believe to be the reality of the situation based on our research into World War II aviation history. I myself am not immune to this type of confirmation bias, as I also have my favourite aircraft and pilots who flew them, and oftentimes I have found myself wondering if the simulator does indeed accurately reflect the relative performance characteristics of a particular airframe. The debate over what is the best platform has been happening since the war itself and will continue to happen long into the future, particularly with all the effort gone into reconstructing digital simulations of the machinery that took part in the great conflagration that is World War II. And this video will by no means settle the debate, but it will offer up a perspective for your consideration when it comes to the modelling of the P-47 Thunderbolt in IL-2 Sturmovik. I'm going to be flying an escort mission during the Normandy campaign 1944 using the P-47D Razorback and we're going to use the same tactics employed by Thunderbolt pilots during this type of mission and see how the P-47 fares against Focke-Wulf FW-190s whose task is to break the bomber formation before it reaches its target. The first and most crucial element of success when flying the Thunderbolt is to always have altitude advantage on your side. Fortunately, bomber escort mission parameters afforded the P-47 the opportunity to operate at higher altitude than the bombers, and as a result, the enemy fighters sent to destroy them. This means you could use the number one advantage of the jug, its dive speed, to drop on top of the attacking aircraft as they busy themselves trying to disrupt the bombers. As the Thunderbolt begins its descent through the clouds below, it rapidly builds speed as its enormous mass seems to drag it out of the sky, spurred on by an enormous 2,000 horsepower double wasp radial engine. I spot a glimpse of a 190 through the cloud and begin to level out my dive and ease off the power to slow my descent, when suddenly a burst of cannon fire can be heard about me as I frantically search for the attacker while blinded in the suit. I once more find the 190 and decide to press my advantage as I'm still picking up speed as I fall from the sky, while still only using a fraction of the power available to me. And once we both penetrate the cloud base, I'm able to commit all 2,000 horses to the pursuit of the 190 as it desperately tries to evade me. At this point, it may seem to the uninitiated that the 190 has outrun the jug in the dive thus leading to the perception that it is poorly modelled. But I can assure you, it only seems that way for now, because the Thunderbolt climbs just as rapidly as it dives, and will soon exploit this 190 pilot's fatal error of going vertical, coming out of a dive for the Thunderbolt, and will pay the price for it. As can be clearly seen, the Thunderbolt has enough latent energy coming out of its dive and into a vertical climb where it can continue to accelerate past the point where the 190 has run out of energy and needs to fall back down to earth. At which point, I am able to turn the jug on its back and repeat the same tactic over again, using the mass of this heavy fighter to quickly gain the necessary speed required to go on another attack run. The 190 repeats his error of attempting to climb away from the pursuing Thunderbolt into the clouds, a desperate act of subterfuge in order to survive the sortie, but as good a strategy as any at this point where his aircraft is visibly damaged, and I break off the attack. Once again, with Altitude as my ally, I turn my attention to another 190 below me and repeat the tried and true strategy of Boom and Zoom I have thus far been employing against them, to equally devastating effect as my Thunderbolt rapidly closes the distance and moves into weapons envelope. However, this 190 pilot is a bit more experienced it would seem and has pulled hard into a turn and pushed my Thunderbolt to the limits of its airframe in an attempt to pursue the evading Luftwaffe fighter. As can be seen, the 190 is capable of turning inside the Thunderbolt and this is perfectly historically congruent with accounts of pilots who have flown both aircraft but as we shall see, there's no guarantee of survival for the 190 in this scenario, as I wrestle my airframe into position for a firing solution. The 
it's at this point i realize to my horror i have become separated from the group and no longer have altitude advantage to continue employing my boom and zoom tactics that have up until now been effective and now find myself being pursued by two one ninety s leaving me no other option than to cut bait and run and hope that i can rejoin the group before being forced to engage I've locked the Thunderbolt into as shallow a dive as I possibly can in order to muster as much speed to maintain the distance between myself and the pursuant Luftwaffe, who at this point seem intent on pressing the engagement. My eyes are locked on my mirrors, altitude and airspeed while the English Channel wits by beneath me. Fortunately, I have been successful in outrunning Kurt Tang's butcher birds and begin my ascent to rejoin with the bomber formation and return to our base in England. However, no sooner than I had rejoined the formation, a Staffel of 190s was spotted attempting to attack the bomber formation on their return leg, and I immediately put my Thunderbolt into a dive to once again repeat my tactics on the attackers. Once again, we can clearly see the enormous speed built by the Thunderbolt even in a shallow dive and how effective it is at closing the distance on the 190s as they attempt to disrupt the bomber formations. Within seconds I am in weapons envelope for my 850 caliber machine guns to do their deadly work and my biggest problem at this point is the fact that I have too much energy in the airframe that I am unable to quickly bleed off like I can in a lighter, smaller, liquid cooled piston engine fighter and I only have a brief window to make my shots count. Then just as quickly as I descend, I am propelled back to the safety of altitude and able to choose when and where to engage next, comfortable in the knowledge that my speed and firepower will carry me through. The result is a perfect sortie with zero loss of fighters or bombers. Given what we've seen here, I feel the developers for IL-2 Sturmovik have done an honest and earnest job of modelling the performance characteristics of this aircraft and when used with the same tactics that were used in World War II for escort missions, it is devastatingly effective. However, it could just as easily have gone the other way had the Luftwaffe pilots used their 190s more effectively and played out to their specific advantages also. Ultimately, the pilot in the seat, their situational awareness, tactics employed, and more often than not, sheer dumb luck played the biggest role in how these kinds of engagements actually resulted during the war. But as far as digital representations go of the machinery and weaponry utilized, I would argue it is accurate as long as you are realistic in your expectations of the airframe and use it most effectively within given mission parameters. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe as they take significantly more effort than just a straight cinematic. Liking, subscribing and commenting tells myself and YouTube that these are worth the effort to produce in the future. Thank you for watching.